We're now trying to understand groups that aren't just SU2 and SU3. Um, so we want to try and mimic the sorts of things we did when we studied those groups. So one of the most important things we did was to write down the weight diagram of a representation of SU2 or of SU3. And we'd like to do that for more general groups. So the weight diagram, if you remember, was what happened if we took our representation and then restricted it to just a representation of the diagonal matrices inside SU2 or SU3. So in other words, we took the subgroup T, which for SU2 was just the matrices E to the I theta, E to the minus I theta, diagonal matrices, where E to the I theta is a unit complex number. And this is a subgroup of SU2 and it's isomorphic to U1. And for SU2, we took the subgroup e to the i theta 1, e to the i theta 2, e to the minus i theta 1 plus theta 2. Um, so we're now e to the i theta 1 and e to the i theta 2 are both unit complex numbers. So unsurprisingly, this one is isomorphic to u1 squared. So more generally, a torus in, I'll write that so it looks like the word it's supposed to be, a torus in a matrix group G is um, a smooth injective homomorphism from U1 to the N to G. So here we had a U1, here we had U1 squared. More generally, we're gonna have U1 to the N. We're gonna have N different thetas. So, okay, I'm, I'm calling the, the injection a torus here. I don't really need to do that. I could just say the image of this injection is a torus. Uh, but the point is, it's a smoothly embedded torus inside the group. Why is it called a torus? Well, here's a picture of a torus. It's like a donut shape. Uh, there are two angular parameters or coordinates, theta one, theta two, on the surface of a donut. So in other words, a donut is u1 times u1 topologically. So uh, u1 to the n is like an n-dimensional version of the ordinary torus. Okay, uh, one more part of the definition, a torus is called maximal if um, it's not contained in a strictly bigger torus. So the examples we've been looking at are examples of maximal tori. So the reason we're restricting to maximal tori or focusing mostly on maximal tori is because this is gonna give us the most refined weight diagram we could hope for, right? So if you imagine for SU3, if we just looked at uh, theta one varying instead of allowing theta two to vary, we'd have ended up with a collection of dots on the line instead of a collection of dots in the plane, and we wouldn't have been able to extract all the nice um, pictures of hexagons and things from, from that. It wouldn't have been enough information. So the maximal torus is sort of probes more of the interesting structure of the group and its representations. So what I want to do in this video is first give you some examples of maximal tori in some of your favorite groups, and then give you a theorem about the existence of um, maximal tori, which we'll prove in subsequent videos um, and some statements that we won't prove. So first example, let's take SUN. Here's a maximal torus. Unsurprisingly, it's the set of diagonal matrices e to the i theta 1 down to e to the i theta n, where, because the determinant is supposed to be 1, theta 1 plus dot 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 plus theta n should be equal to 0. 
Okay, so that's exactly like we had uh, for SU2 and SU3. Let's do a different kind of example. Let's think about SO3, the rotation group in three dimensions. So it turns out that our maximal torus for this is the set of rotations, say, around some fixed axis like the z-axis. So cos theta minus sine theta zero, uh, sine theta cos theta zero, 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 one. Okay, so that is an example of a maximal torus. It's a one-dimensional torus inside SO3. I'm not going to prove that that's maximal, but it, it, it is. What about SO4? Well, we can get a slightly bigger torus uh, because we can use cos theta 1 minus sine theta 1, sine theta 1, cos theta 1 in the top left block of our matrix. And then in the bottom right block, we can use cos theta 2 minus sine theta 2, sine theta 2, cos theta 2. And on the off diagonal blocks, I'm just going to stick zeros everywhere. So that's a two dimensional torus. Uh, what about SO5? Well, it turns out you can't get any bigger. So you're just going to use this matrix and then stick a one um, down in the in the bottom uh, right. And zeros everywhere else. So you still have a, a two dimensional maximal torus inside SO5. So this shows something is different between uh, the theory of odd dimensional rotation groups and even dimensional rotation groups. Um, somehow the odd dimensional ones uh, have smaller maximal tori than you might expect. In other words, there's a lot of off diagonal stuff in SO5 um, compared to this uh, block diagonal uh, maximal torus. Okay, so we will see in in the rep when we study the representation theory of SO even and SO odd that they are quite different. Um, okay, so this is how rotation groups work in general. If you're an SO even, you just have um, block diagonal matrices cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta. Um, and for odd dimensional ones, you have the same, but with an extra one in the bottom right. These are all examples of maximal tori. Okay, here's a theorem um, f about compact groups. So let G be a compact, uh, I'm gonna say path connected, matrix group then here are some statements first of all uh, G contains a non-trivial torus as long as G isn't the trivial group so if G isn't just the identity then it contains a torus that's not just the identity, so like a u1 or a u1 squared or something high dimensional. Second of all, um, actually any element of G is contained in a torus. Okay, so if there's not just one Torus. Like we've been looking at these diagonal guys, but there turn out to be many, many tori. Um, and in fact, you can find a tori, torus containing any, any element of G. Three, any torus is contained in a maximal torus. So there's plenty of maximal tori. And part four. Okay, there are many maximal tori, but they're all related in some way. 
So if T1 and T2 are maximal tori, then they're conjugate in the sense that there exists a G in G such that T2 equals G, T1, G inverse. So in some sense, the maximal torus is unique up to conjugation. So we are not going to prove part four. The proof of this would take us too far away from uh, the main theme of the course. The proof uses the left gets fixed point theorem, a really nice piece of topology, and it is a really nice proof. Um, so if you want, you can do a project on that. But it does require you to know a bit of topology. Uh, part two, I'm also not really going to prove. I'll kind of make a comment about it while I'm proving part one. It's not hard to prove, but it would, again, take us away from where we need, and we don't even need part two. It's still kind of useful to know sometimes. So we're going to prove part one and part three uh, to some extent in some of the videos. So just before I move on to the proof, which will be the next video, uh, I want to give you an example to show why we need to work with compact groups for this theorem to be true. So suppose G is the group R with addition, which is the real numbers with addition. That's a perfectly nice group, but it doesn't contain a non-trivial torus. You know, the, the real line doesn't contain a circle, so there's no way we're going to get a non-trivial torus inside G. So it contains no non-trivial torus. Uh, let me also explain why I put the word path connected there. That's really for part two. Here's an example of a disconnected group and an element of that group that's not contained in the torus. So take uh, G to be O2, rotations and reflections in two dimensions. So we've seen that has two components. There's a component consisting of rotations that contains the identity, component consisting of reflections that doesn't. So the claim is any reflection is not contained in a maximal torus because there's only one maximal torus in this case. It's just uh, the identity component of the group. That is a circle, it's a torus, one dimensional torus. That's the only maximal torus. So in this case, uh, this element G, it's not contained in a maximal torus. So this is to show that compactness is necessary. And this was to show that path connectedness is necessary. Okay, so in the next couple of videos, we're going to prove this theorem.